Um, I did fail to mention that John said, well, we mentioned last week that John's mom had COVID-19 and um, she did not, she tested negative for that and so uh, no longer has it. And so that's a, a praise that we wanted to share. But 2 Corinthians chapter number five uh, is where we're going to be today. And uh, really plugging along at this idea of being changed, of what it takes uh, to be an experienced spiritual change. And um, this kind of goes hand in hand with uh, the 90 day journal that we've been doing and that many of you have been doing. Uh, it seems like that as soon as we started that, uh, life, got cra life gets crazy in our church and stuff, but um, hopefully in your lives you've been able to stay, uh, stay up to date with it. Uh, I believe it has been a help to many of you and uh, been a help even in my own life. Um, and so if we don't knock it out in these 90 days, if it ends up taking us 98 days, that's okay. Um, but I'm thankful uh, for those of you who are involved in it and, and, uh, and consistent with it. And so I want to commend you on that. But uh, I wanted to take you to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, uh, a popular verse, but one that I think is important for us to understand. And so today for the next couple of minutes, I want to talk to you about when does change occur? When does change occur? And we've really been walking through kind of uh, what does change look like was what we talked about last week. Took you to the life of uh, Saul before he was uh, became Paul. Uh, but then we talked about what does change actually look like in our lives. And then this week, I want to really ask you and, and explain to you from the Word of God, when does change occur? You see, we talk a lot about the change that comes from the Word of God and the change that comes from the Christian life. And one of the things that I believe very firmly is that if the gospel doesn't have the power to change your life on this earth, then really I, I think that we would all agree that there doesn't need to, we don't need to be wasting our time here. Um, we don't need to be wasting others' time sharing the gospel. We don't, don't need to be wasting our time uh, really even gathering as a church if the gospel doesn't change our lives here on this earth. And so when we think about that and when we take that belief, then what we have to understand is if we believe that, then how does that happen? When does it happen? When do we actually see change occur in our lives? And so I want to take you to a popular verse just really to use as a springboard passage for today. But 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, let's read verse 17. The Bible says this, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And then he says in verse number 18, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. I want to look at three different times that change occurs in the life of a Christian. And here's what I want to ask you to do. I want to ask you personally if you have ever experienced these moments. And if you have not, now I will, I will give you a quick caveat that two of the three moments are moments that I believe are continual. They should be happening often in our lives. But the first moment is something that I believe that we all should experience for ourselves. And so I want to talk for the next couple minutes, like I've already said, about when does change occur? When does it happen? Because if we believe that it can happen, we also it's important for us to understand when it happens. And so let's pray and we'll ask the Lord to help us. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you uh, for the day that you've given us. We thank you that you are a God of change. Lord, I pray that you would help us today to recognize that these moments are, are things that you are working in. Lord, these are moments that you are, are shaping us, you are changing us, you're shaving something off, you're adding something to us so that we can become more like your son. Lord, I ask that you would give me the words to say today. Lord, give me strength as I teach. Lord, I pray that you would help it to be applied to the hearts and lives of these young adults. In your name we pray. Amen. Change is often something that is hard to diagnose. Um, I don't know that very many people recognize it in the process of change. Most of you probably cannot recall a time in your life where um, you just uh, you were not walking and then all of a sudden you were walking, okay, if you were a baby. Uh, most of the time you don't recall a certain time where it was like, well, I didn't understand math concepts, but now I do understand math concepts. That's part of the educational change that occurs in your life. 
maybe you're in college and, and maybe you don't ever you don't have a certain moment where your relationship begins to change with maybe an opposite gender or something, a significant other, but you know that the change occurs. And so when you look back on life, Maybe you were a terrible driver at 15 years old, and then now that you're 23, 24 years old, you're like, I'm a little bit better, hopefully, <laughs> all right? But change just happens. And sometimes it's hard to diagnose when it happens. It's hard to understand and recognize in the moment that, hey, I am changing, okay? Maybe something's clicking as you're sitting in a class. Maybe, maybe there's something that you learn. Change is really a process. Change is something to where it's a direction you're going, and when you look back, all of a sudden, you have changed. The same is true, really, in the Christian life, is that very rarely do we as Christians sit maybe in a church service or have a moment in our Bible reading or have a moment of prayer where we say, this is a moment that is changing me. But there are very specific times and principles that do lead to change in the Christian life. I want us to look at three of them today. The first one right out of this passage is this, is that change occurs at salvation. Change occurs at salvation. Now let me explain this to you, okay? For some of you, you were saved at a young age. How many of you in the room, you were saved under the age of eight? You were saved under the age of eight, okay? Okay. How many of you were saved under the age of 10? Under the age of 10. You can keep your hand up if you were with the 8 group, all right, because that's still under 10, all right? Um, how many of you were saved under the age of 15? Under the age of 15? How many of you were saved under the age of 18? Under the age of 18, all right? How many of you would say were saved under the age of 21? We'll go one more, all right? Under the age of 21, just so we make sure we get everybody, all right? So for those of you in the room that may be under the age of 8 or even under the age of 10 or, or in some of those earlier ages, you weren't really changed from anything at salvation, okay? Maybe you didn't steal toys in the nursery anymore or, or whatever, okay? That's really the, the best sin that you have in your past. And sometimes it's easy to look at maybe the testimonies of, of someone who's been saved from a drug addiction or been saved from alcohol or saved from whatever, and you just think, wow, man, the only thing I got saved from was that I stopped stealing toys, all right? That's not the point of salvation. What we have to understand is that salvation not only changes our eternity, but it also changes who we are in the eyes of God. Meaning this, that you are now no longer viewed as a sinner in God's eyes. The Bible talks about being clothed in His righteousness. Now, when God looks down from heaven and sees you, He doesn't see your sin, He doesn't see your problems, He doesn't see all of your failures and your mistakes. He sees the blood of His Son. And so, you have been changed. The important thing to understand is this, is that you can be changed and not live as though you are changed. And one of the great downfalls of many people who accept Jesus Christ at a young age is this, is that we lean on a salvation and, a, and being saved at a young age to get us to heaven, but here's what we do. We almost operate as though that did not happen. We go and we seek joy in other areas. We go and we seek fulfillment in, in maybe other areas. We, we don't know that we want God's will. We don't know that we want to be a part of the church. It, it, often our Christianity can become cold and complacent. Why? Because it's something that we have not properly grasped. And here's what I want you to see. Is that many times looking back to that salvation is one of the greatest motivators to change right now in this moment. If you've been saved maybe at five, six years old, Looking back at what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross should motivate you to change right now here as a 21, 22, 23, 18-year-old, 30-year-old, whatever you may be. And sometimes because we believe that we weren't saved from great sin, we also fail, we also fail to understand that we have a great salvation. We think that, well, just because I wasn't saved off the streets and just because I wasn't involved in drug abuse and I wasn't involved in alcohol and I wasn't involved in some wicked lifestyle, God didn't save me from that. It's almost like the, some Christians believe that, well, I have to go and experiment with that just to see if it is as bad as what everybody says. When the truth is, is that salvation, because you are new, you should act differently. I want you to think for just a moment about the things in your life that have become new, okay? 
it would be weird for you to go and buy a new phone. You go and buy iPhone, I don't even know what number we're on anymore, all right? iPhone 27, okay? I'm sure they'll come up with a more creative way to name them once they get higher, all right? If we keep just coming up with numbers, then I'm going to be very disappointed in Apple's creativity, all right? But you go and you get a new iPhone. What's one of the first things that you want to do? You want to ditch the old phone, right? You sit there and you, you maybe log into your iCloud account and you're trying to get everything transferred over and you're, you're trying to make sure that you have all of your contacts. Why? Because something that is new creates a discontentment with what is old, right? All of a sudden, that old phone gets thrown in a drawer somewhere until you find it five, six years from now, and you think, I wonder if my charger still fits it, and it doesn't, all right, okay? Something that is old kind of gets pushed to the back burner. Why? Because there's been something new. And in your life, please listen to this. If you are here and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's time to put that old nature in a drawer and push it away and become consumed with the new life that you have in Jesus Christ. It would be strange for you to walk around and keep both phones in your pocket, wouldn't it? Well, I just have so much, old, so much, of, so much good memories on my old phone. I just have, I just have so, I'm just so comfortable with my old phone. That's what, that is what old people do, okay, for those of you who are like, well, I better just keep it around just in case, okay? Don't live your Christian life that way. You get a new car. What's one of the first things that you do? You park the old car in the driveway and you start driving the new car, right? You go to the car wash. You, you, you clean everything up. You get the old one ready to sell. Why? Because you need, it off, you need it out of your driveway. You need it off the lot. You need the finances to be able to pay on the new car, right? Why? Because there's something new in your life, and so the old should be passed away. So first of all, change occurs at salvation. That doesn't matter what age you got saved at, change occurs at salvation. The question is this, are you living in light of that change? The second one is this, change occurs in sanctification. Change occurs in sanctification. Much wiser people than me have broken the Christian life down into three phases. Justification, meaning salvation. Sanctification, meaning God's growth process. And then, my mind just went blank on the glorification. There it is. Glorification, meaning the, eventually when you go to heaven. When you look at your life in those three phases of justification, I'm saved, sanctification, God is working on me, and then glorification, God is calling me home, here's what we have to ask ourselves. Is if I am between justification and glorification, what is God teaching me and changing in my life in this moment? Because sanctification is a part of the Christian life. God didn't just save you to leave you the same. And so right now, here's the question. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this because I want us to get to the last thought so that we can close this lesson. But here's the question that I want to ask you today. What is God teaching you right now? You see, I am a firm believer that every Christian should be able to answer that question. Every Christian should have something that God is teaching them right now. It may not be anything big. It may be something small. It may be just something that God's put, some thought that God's put on your heart. You know what? I, I, need, I want to do more this year. I want, I want to give more. I want, I want to pray more. Maybe God's convicted you of the way that you talk to someone or the way that you talk about someone. Tonight, Lord willing, in our evening service, I'm going to preach on the change of revival. We just had our fall tent revival last week. And isn't it interesting that we call it revival? But here's the truth, is that revival comes with change, okay? Meaning this, that if nothing changed in your life, you didn't have revival. You attended. You, you showed up. You sat under a tent. You clapped when the clerk sang, okay? But if nothing changed then you didn't have revival. And what we've got to understand is this, is that as long as we are here on this earth, God is still changing us. 
God still has something new and something different and something that he desires to do a work in our lives. Why? Because he desires for us to become more like his son, Jesus Christ. And so if God has not put anything in your life that he says, this is what I'm teaching you, the question that I would have for you is, are you referring back to those ways that he promises to change you? Are you faithful to church? Are you in God's word? Are you walking with him? Are you praying? Are you asking him to show you something? So first of all, change occurs at salvation. Secondly, change occurs in sanctification. And then thirdly, is change occurs through surrender. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter number 12. Romans chapter number 12. I apologize for the additional background music for today. Romans 12. The Bible says this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good an acceptable and perfect will of God. There's a lot of change words in that passage. He talks about presenting your bodies. He talks about that it's a reasonable service. Then he says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, be ye changed by the renewing of your mind. And here's what I want to ask you. Is as a child of God, Has anything changed in your life in the last month? If not, here's the follow-up question. Could it be that it's not because God has not challenged you to change? Could it be that there's not even things in your life that need to be changed? Could it be that you've not surrendered yourself to that change? Because here's what we understand out of this passage is that change requires sacrifice. Change requires me giving up what I love to really begin to do what God desires in my life. Change means that I may have to break off a relationship. Change means that I may have to go to my boss and ask for a different work schedule. Change means that I may have to change up a class schedule or, or change means that I may have to cancel a, a streaming service for something that I'm watching. Change means that I may have to filter my internet. Change means whatever. Change means that there will be sacrifice. And I think that here's what we all understand. We're all giddy about change that occurs at salvation. Oh, I'm a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Like, we get all excited about that one, all right? And we're even okay with the change process that happens in sanctification. God shows us something, and he maybe, as I said in my prayer, shaves something off. He, sh- he shapes us to become more like his son. He molds us. He, he tweaks something in our lives. He-, he says this is something that isn't working. And so he shows us that. We're okay with that. But all of a sudden, the change that is the result of surrender and sacrifice, we question. And I think that sometimes as Christians, we have a tendency to dig our heels in And to say, God, I will do anything but give this portion of my life to you. Change sometimes costs you some money. Change sometimes costs you time. Change sometimes is not always a convenient path. When we look for the easiest path from point A to point B, what we miss is that sometimes God has a way of teaching us and directing us in this long path. And we've talked about this. We talked about the long will home in the life of Joseph in our series on Thy Will Be Done. And sometimes God teaches you more by taking you the long route than he does by just taking you the convenient route. And here, please do not miss this today. Yes, you have experienced a change that occurs at salvation. 
You are a new creature. You're called to live in that newness and not to go back to the old. But if you are unwilling to surrender, if you're unwilling to sacrifice and give up some of what you have in your life, of, of maybe some of what is comfortable to you, of maybe some of what is, what is growing complacent in your life, maybe some of just the things that are in your, maybe on your TV or maybe on your phone, if you're unwilling to give some of those temporary pleasures up, here's what you have to understand. Do not expect spiritual change to occur in your life. And the sad state of many Christians and many churches is this. Is that we will do everything but surrender to change. We'll maybe change our dress standards. We'll, we'll change our music standards. We'll, we'll change the way that we, we post on social media. We'll even maybe change some of the, some of the things that we, people that we hang out with. We'll, we'll walk the part. We'll talk the part. But here's what we miss, is that eventually in that process of sanctification, there will be a change that must be accompanied with sacrifice and surrender. And there comes a point in many Christians' life where we just say, God, that's too much for you to ask. It's too much for you to ask me to give up this relationship that I'm very comfortable in. It's too much for you to ask for me to give up 10% to give. It's too much for you to ask for me to give whatever, to, to cancel Netflix because I, I, I'm duped into watching something that I shouldn't have. It's too much for me to go back to a dumb phone. Everybody else has a smartphone, but if your phone is tripping you up spiritually, guess what? I don't care if you have to go back to a typewriter. Do something. I don't think you can text on those, okay? But do something that protects you. If it's a relationship, if it's a friendship, if it's a dating relationship, if it's a job, I can promise you this. That surrendering to godly change is something that does not cost you, it pays you. And in our little minds, in our little earthly perspective, we assume, well, breaking off this relationship is going to cost me. When it actually ends up paying you eternally. Well, breaking off that habit is going to cost me. It's going to pay off eternally and the bible says this lay not up for yourselves treasures where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven and here's the sad truth that there will be many christians that have a stockpile on earth and are bankrupt in heaven We have all of these things that we can look to and we can say, well, my joy is found in this and my happiness is found in this. And when we stand before Jesus Christ, our Savior and God, our Heavenly Father, one day, we will have nothing to show for. We've already gotten our reward. We've already gained it all down here. And rather than give up a few things that makes the stockpile a little less here, but pays off dividends in eternity, for many of us, we would rather have this than that. And so here's what I want to talk you through. Have you had a moment in your life, first of all, of salvation, based off of the show of hands and based off of everyone that I see in the room, uh, knowing most of you and knowing most of your testimonies, I believe that many of you have had a moment of salvation if you have not, or if you have doubts about that, get that settled today. I would, I would love to talk to you. If you're here and you're a girl, my, my wife would love to talk to you, okay? Have you had that moment of salvation? But the question to follow up with that is, are you living in the newness of that salvation? Have you allowed those old things to be passed away? And behold, all things are become new. The second question is in the sanctification process, what is God teaching you right now? What is God changing in your life right now because that's sanctification i like to refer to sanctification sometimes as as someone who's molding some sort of statue okay putting something together 
in every statue and in every, every head crest that you see, okay? They slap something on and there comes a point to where they have to shave something off, okay? That's too much. And if God is shaping you, please listen to this, to become more like his son, that may mean that he needs to shave something off. That may mean that he needs to add something to your life. So what is God teaching you in this sanctification process? But then thirdly, have you had a moment, and I don't, don't even want to say a moment, because we all have checked a little box out on a team camp card that says, I'm surrendering my life to the Lord, okay? Like, we've all done that. But have you had moments, plural, of surrender? Have you had moments, plural, daily moments where you say, Lord, I don't understand this. I don't even know that I agree with it, okay? I know that it's going to cost me, but I'm surrendering this to you. Surrendering this relationship to you. I'm surrendering this moment to you. I'm surrendering my finances to you. Have you had moments where in that sanctification process, God says, I want to change this in your life. And you've, rather than digging your heels in, you've put your hands up and you've said, Lord, I surrender to you because change occurs at salvation change occurs through the sanctification process but until you surrender change will not occur in really any of those until you give it over to the lord and so with every head bowed and every eye closed we're going to pray and we're going to be done but i want you to walk through those questions with me one more time are you living in the newness of your salvation if change occurs at salvation, are you living a new life or are you still hanging on to the old? Are you walking around with the two phones in your pocket rather than just the one new one? Are you driving the old car rather than driving the new one? Behold, all things are become new. Are you living in the newness of your salvation? Secondly, what is God teaching you right now? I want you to think for just a second in the quietness of this moment. What is God teaching you right now? The third question is this. Are you surrendered to what God wants to change in your life? Are you surrendered to what God wants to change in your life? With every head bowed and every eye closed, let's pray. We'll ask the Lord to bless the rest of your day. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your love for us. Lord, we thank you. Just for your goodness and your kindness, Lord, you're so gracious and you're so patient even in my own life. I know that you look down at my life and you think that, and you wish that things would change in, in my heart. And Lord, I ask that even in my own life that I would be surrendered to that. Lord, I pray that you would bless these young adults. Lord, I pray that you would help them to experience the change that comes from salvation the change that occurs through sanctification. Lord, may you teach them and may you show them and may you shape them into the image of your Son. But Lord, I pray that you would also allow them to be surrendered to the change that comes into their hearts, into their lives. Lord, we ask that you would give us grace for this journey that we call the Christian life. In your name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed. Good to see everybody. Emily, good to see you. Good to see you. Just you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Let's go. How long are you in for? Okay. Well, well, good to see you. Tell Ryan we said hi. He has one of my favorite Instagram accounts to look at, especially right now during the fall.